Hello everyone, my name is Clive Mitchell uh, and I'm an industrial mineralogist at the British Geological Survey in the UK. My talk today, uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are, welcome. Uh, my talk today is called Development Priorities and Perspectives for Industrial Mineral Resources. So, who am I? I'm an experienced geologist, I'm a chartered geologist at the British Geological Survey. Past work of mine has included resource assessments in many places. I've been lucky enough to work in Africa, the Middle East and other places. I focused on resources such as brick clay, construction aggregates, silica sand, limestone, kaolin, a whole variety of different minerals in my career. Currently, I'm looking at artisanal and small scale gold mining in Kenya and also graphite resources in East Africa. So quite a varied portfolio of, of materials I've worked on in my career. And this presentation really is based on that experience. So who is the British Geological Survey? So if you're not aware of the British Geological Survey, the BGS is the UK's Geological, National Geological Survey, a world leading independent research organization providing objective expert geoscience data and information. It's part of the UK research and innovation uh, overseen by the Natural Environment Research Council. It's, and also, it's the oldest geological survey on the planet, first established in 1835. So, as I said before, these are really my thoughts and perspectives on uh, how you would go about organising a sort of national mineral resource assessment. So, the first point, geological baselines. Second, demand-led resource assessment. And thirdly, communicate, engage and support. And I'll go through these one at a time. The first one, geological baselines. This is essentially geological mapping, geological information. And this is a map of the Emirates. This is a national scale of the United Arab Emirates. And as you can see, a large proportion of this country, over 90% is covered by sand, by deserts. In the top of uh, the northeast here, you can see the blue sticking up. This is the Musandam Peninsula, this is the limestones and also the sort of purple and the green. This is part of the Ophiolite sequence just north of Amman. And the British Geological Survey carried out a mapping program over a 10 year period. This is one of my colleagues, Catherine. We carried out two phases. We had a phase, a first phase, 2002 to six, and a second phase, eight to 12. And this was accompanied by a largely physical exercise, a big, big survey, as well as mineral assessments and other activities, you hazard assessment, seismic monitoring, etc. This, this provided a whole suite of maps, as you can see here. This is showing you the whole range of maps which were then produced for the, for the UAE. Most of these are 1 to 100,000 scale maps. Up in the north here, you can see there's a set of 1 to 50k maps as well. And this covers the entire country. So this is nice, modern geological mapping and information all, all backed up with reports uh, for, the, for the Emirates. Now, it, it, in the United Kingdom, the British Geological Survey obviously has produced lots of geological maps in its time. And all of these maps are now available, mostly available uh, online as digital copies. But you can also buy paper copies if you'd so like. But you can go onto our website and you can download a lot of the information. If you get, if you Google open geoscience, you will come across the free data which is available by the BGS. There's a huge amount of information from maps, data, scans, photographs, boreholes, for example, scans of borehole logs are particularly interesting. One of the really interesting things for professional geologists working in the industries, mining industry, etc., is something called Geo Index, which is available both onshore and offshore. This provides a very detailed amount of information. We also have something called the BGS Maps Portal. Now, every single map we've ever produced, even the historic ones, so we're talking something like 6,000 maps, have had high resolution scanning, and these are all available to, to, to view online on the website, on the map viewer. It's absolutely fantastic. So here we go. This is, this is, a, this is a small segment of geo-index geo on, geo onshore. What this is showing is it's a bit like you would have an ArcGIS on your computer. You can draw in data layers and I've selected various data layers and you can see here I've, I've got the geology and also I've selected uh, mineral resource layers and the silica sand. And this sort of darkish red blob here is uh, silica sand resource. 
and we have a legend which gives you a, a description of all the different types of silicon sand resource that we'll find in the UK. This is extremely powerful. This is showing exactly where companies can go and carry out assessments and maybe decide to have a silicon sand quarry, for example. So this is extremely useful. So that's the first part, really. It's the sort of geological baseline. You need to have good geological information before you can then progress on to the second part of our, of our three-point plan, which is the demand-led resource assessment. So what does that actually mean? Well, for many years, uh, geological surveys, ministries would adopt what I would call a sort of A to Z inventory approach to mineral resources, which is where they would essentially start at the beginning of the alphabet and start looking at Andalusite and asbestos and work their way through all the minerals they can find in their country until they get to zeolite and zircon at the very, at the very other end and produce uh, sort of maps and directories and spend a lot of time and effort over many years looking at a lot of minerals. Now that's all very well and good however many of those minerals would be completely uneconomic, there'd be absolutely zero point in looking at them. So the current approach and the one that I like to adopt is where you actually consider what minerals do we actually need and what minerals are, do we have available in, in economic amounts from technical quality etc. So what I suggest we do now is we, we look at the demand in country, maybe regionally, maybe internationally, and then match that with what mineral resources we have in country and focus and prioritise the small resources that typically ministries will have these days for carrying out mineral resource assessments. Coupled with that, we have, to make, we have to make sure that we employ experienced mineral geologists, technical specialists and GIS experts to help us then marshal this information that we're going to generate. The third aspect here is to engage with industry. This is extremely important. And unless you understand the processes and the raw material requirements of industry, how will you know what to look for? You need to match their requirements to what we find in the ground. So we look at our resources and we need to find resources which match the quality of the material they require. That then leads us on to the reconnaissance. The regional reconnaissance is essentially a survey, not a detailed survey, but we're looking at known mineral occurrences to try and find those resources which match the requirements of industry. So this will, this will be boots on the ground, field work, collecting samples which are then analysed in laboratories. Those tests have been informed by the properties we found out about by our discussions with industry. Then we'll create a mineral occurrence database. Hopefully you'll build on a mineral occurrence database that already exists. And this is typically linked to a geographical information system in ARC or other, 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 other software. So I decided to choose a commodity just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Now, these is a list of properties here. So we've got chemical composition, particle size, etc. These show you some of the properties to focus on for silica sand. So chemical composition, so silica, for example, it's an extremely important component. Um, Quartz is essentially the main, main phase, mineral phase that you'll find in the silica sand. But other minerals will be present as well, which will contribute to these, mineral, these other chemical impurities such as iron, aluminum, alkali, etc. Particle size distribution is a, a very important parameter for silica sand. Do we want a fine or a narrow particle size range? So th this means basically are all the particles a similar size or is there a broad range of sizes? And particle shape. Are they round, are they angular, are they spherical, or are they other different shapes like patio or acicular? These have a bearing on the application of the silica sand for a particular application. Refractory minerals, well, I think this is really referring to where sand is used for, for, for the manufacture of glass. Things like zircon, chromite, and corundum are refractory. They won't melt at the temperatures that, that the, the quartz grain melts at. They remain as little specks. If you look at a piece of pane of glass, you might see a little black blob. That could be a refractory mineral. And other contaminant minerals like clay and feldspar, et cetera, interfere with the composition of, of, of certain products like glass, but also they might interfere with the process itself. They might, the dust, for example, might fly around in the furnace causing problems. All of these properties are used to design something known as an industrial specification. And this is a technical agreement between the producer of the mineral and the consumer of the mineral. They come to an understanding that the, the, the producer will, will supply mineral at this specific uh, quality and the quantity and regularly, and then that becomes the, the technical agreement, the specification. And here we go. This, is, this gives you a sort of an idea of some of the things that um, 
are, are, are specified. This is this is a summary really based on many specifications. And you can see that we have things like colorless glass, flat glass, colored glass. They all have slightly different parameters. For example, colorless glass has a very low iron content because iron contributes to coloring. So if you have higher amounts of iron, you might then go from away from clear glass to say brown or green or brown glass. And alumina is another important thing which affects the, 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 the properties of the glass as well as the alkalis and the particle size. If you have sand grains which are outside of these sand if they're too big, they won't melt. If they're too small, they'll fly away. Dust, as I mentioned before, dust is a problem. And angular quartz has suggested that sometimes that can be an advantage for, um, for melting, for melting the sand. This then brings me on. So we've got our geology, we've carried out our resource assessments, we, we've got all of this information and maps and reports. That in itself is not enough. We need to go on to the third stage, which is to communicate, to engage, and then to support. And this photo here is, is from the front cover of the national newspaper in the Emirates, and this is showing me with a big sledgehammer as part of a dimension stone resource assessment and the newspapers found out what we were doing came along this really counts i think as a way of communicating the research that was being carried out because people are now aware that the fact that there is dimension stone in the emirates but also that, that we may be able to find out how, how to find out that information so in, in terms of communication we need to publish this information that we generated the geological and the resource information the data, the maps, the reports, the commodity profiles, the fact sheets, the mineral statistics. We also need to provide web map services via online portals and apps with access to layers for different uh, information on geology, mineral recurrences, and land use designations. Apps are a very good way. Now, the, that we have an app in the, in the UK called iGeology. This is an extremely powerful way of accessing information on geology. You also need to consider um, creating resources for attracting inward investments. Companies that are interested in developing mineral resources require certain types of information, make it easy for them, provide a portal, maybe provide experts that are, that are good at liaising with investors to try and actually help them along the way. And that's the last point I'll make here is all of this information must be freely accessible online. We call it open access at no cost, it has to be free. But also don't put any other barriers in the way, such as creating contact details or account passwords. This is a big put off for a lot of people. It might actually, that investor might just say, oh, I, can't, I can't be bothered, I'm gonna look at somewhere else. If you do want the contact details of, of people that are interested in, in the resources in your country, think about creating a news service, like an e-newsletter, an, e an email newsletter. They will then put in their details gladly one time only and then there will be they will have that contact you will have a database of contacts this is their way of reminding them when there's a new map or report or study or so it's a good way of staying in contact with people here we go for it so this is i mentioned the ideology app we, we created something called the m geology app for the emirates this is a free app that you put on your smartphone and it uses the GPS on your phone to locate you on the geological map on the screen of your phone. You can then click on the little sort of colored areas of the map and that will tell you the geology of where you're standing or maybe the other areas around you. And this displays all of the information and this is available in English and Arabic. This is only, uh, this is only Apple, iGeology in the UK is Android. Hopefully in the future, mGeology will copy that as well. Engagement. And we've, we've communicated our information, you still need to do more work, you still need to get up there and you need to present exactly as I'm doing now, presenting this presentation to you via Zoom. I am um, at conferences very regularly in the Middle East, so for example the mining show, the Vajera Forum, the Big Five in Dubai, presenting information about mineral resources. And exhibition stands behind on this photo is, is the Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure stand at one of these um, exhibitions. And this is important because it enables people to come up to you and speak to you directly. And you can answer their queries, you can show them maps and reports. And this is a very important function. This then enables you to develop contacts. And by repeating this exercise, you can't just do it once, it has to be a continuous process. You maintain those contacts. And that's the other aspect as well. If people outside want to find out who to contact, provide that content, contact information. If you go on the British Geological Survey website, you will find the contact details for all of our staff. 
with a profile and also a list of their publications. This is extremely important. They can then narrow it down to find exactly the right person to contact. And this is a bit mutually beneficial because people contact me all the time with from the, the profile information on the BGS website about the work that I'm doing. This is then may lead on to the next piece of work that I'll do in the future. So this is extremely important. And finally, the last, the last sort of part of this is, is support. If there are investors out there who are interested in coming to your country to look at resources, adopt what I would describe as an inquiry service approach. Now we have this ethos at the British Geological Survey that if people contact us, we will then oblige to spend time to help them with their inquiry. I do this regularly, people email me, I provide as much help as information as I possibly can, but there's a certain given time. And that's the other aspect of it, be responsive reply timely, make sure that you reply within the sort of few days and be informative and help as much as you can. It may be that they want to come and visit. Try and help host that visit for them and then help them facilitate discussions with other people that you've met, for example, in your discussions in industry and others. It's extremely important. This creates an extremely good impression uh, for, in your country and it also may then lead on to a good relationship and, and that company then may decide to invest, which would be fantastic. So in conclusion, the three points of, of my, my plan for mineral development. Geological baselines, up-to-date geological line work and information online via web map services and apps and downloadable maps and reports. Demand-led resource assessment, technical evaluation apps for industrial minerals available online as free maps and reports. And communicate, engage and support freely accessible information and data, regular engagement with industry and potential investors, and an inquiry service approach. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm more than happy if you want to get in touch with me. My email address is here and my Twitter address is here. Twitter address is here. Please contact me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>